What is the worst or best misinterpretation of a rule or ability that you have seen? Part 1 A few weeks ago, I came across a redditor that thought you added hit die plus class level minus 1 times con mod, con meaning constitution, HP every time you leveled up rather than just hit die plus con mod. That was an interesting conversation. Blair who thinks pass without trace is the same as mass invisibility every single session and needs to have it explained that it doesn't render the group invisible every single time. Player who thinks lightning arrow lets them have infinite lightning arrows for the entire encounter. This is almost in gazebo territory. But I've heard a story of a guy who played in a game back in either OD&D, Basic, or 1E AD&D where Turn Undead was interpreted very differently. The cleric became one of the undead for a short period, you see. This gets interesting because AD&D and earlier did a table with various undead on it keyed to levels. So, at low levels, skeletons, then zombies, ghouls, etc. Up to vampires and mummies at higher levels. So, your cleric would turn into the listed monster, right? Makes sense. Low-level cleric could become a skeleton for a while, high-level cleric a ghoul or a ghost. High-level undead have two very important things. Widely varying abilities. A mummy and a vampire are extremely different. Level drain. In this era, you lost entire levels to the touch of high-level undead like vampires. This led to the amusing image of clerics turning into high-level undead that can fly, like vampires, and fighting each other, then dealing with weirdness as level drain. Changes them into entirely different monsters. So, the vampire gets drained and becomes a mummy, which can't fly. So now, drops like, well, a bag of bones and dried out tissues held together by cloth wrappings. Oh, that's pretty good. I had a buddy that up until last week thought you added your proficiency bonus to damage rolls too. Player uses Mold Earth Cantrip to create an Earth Umbrella for the entire group while traveling at normal pace. Personally witnessed. Redditor uses Mage Hand to stop the heart of an enemy. One hit KO. Pretty much every cantrip ever. Sacred Flame is not fire, nor does it light things on fire. Minor Illusion can't make a moving realistic dragon. Using Lightning Lure to drink from a mug. Cast light on enemy's nose to blind them. Thinking you could cast spells that were your wizard level, i.e. a level 6 wizard could cast level 6 spells. I had a discussion with one guy on this sub or another who thought that after Xanathar's guide, every warlock gets every invocation as long as they meet the prerequisites and would refuse to listen to reason. Not sure if this is 100% topical, but it happened recently. I was running my D&D game 5e and a PC rogue flanked a monster and mentioned he should have advantage. It was a rule I didn't recall, but being used to 3.5, I allowed it and then forgot to look it up later. The same player DMs a 5e campaign at work, in which I and a few other co-workers play. The week following the aforementioned incident, my ranger flanked an NPC monster, and when I went to roll with advantage for flanking, he pointed out that the rule was an optional rule that he wasn't using. I pointed out that he cited the rule when he was playing in my game as a rule, not an optional rule. He smiled and said, yeah, I know. Wow, what an asshole. One of my first times being DM, an experienced player assured me he could cast Leoman's Tiny Hut instantaneously, which actually takes one minute, and that it was completely impenetrable from the outside. It is. But that he and anyone inside of the hut can shoot projectiles through the hut. They can't. They managed to kill my big, bad dragon boss by hiding in the hut and hurling spells and arrows at it. Being new to DMing, I didn't know the actual spell and was too busy trying to keep the action going. I didn't want to stop everything while I rule checked, and I certainly didn't want to question someone who had been DMing and playing for a decade. 
I did look up the spell the next day because it did seem broken. Turns out the player's memory isn't great and I should have made him show me the spell. Lesson learned. Way back in second, our DM believed that area of effect damage was divided amongst the targets. So a fireball hurled at a horde of orcs might do eight points of damage to each of them. My DM misinterpreted the rules for Elven Trance, thinking that, since they don't sleep, they get the effects of a long rest from a short rest. This led to the Elf PCs getting more than double the amount of spells and healing as the non-Elves. Talk about infuriating. Our party once obliterated the DM's dragon boss because he didn't realize Tasha's hideous laughter was supposed to be rolled every time it was hit as well as every turn. So we just beat to death a dragon who was laughing uncontrollably. Ah, uh, worst. Must be from 3.5 where a player found a spell of sorts for the ninja class, which allowed for one Kai point to effectively cast Disguise Self and two Kai points to cast Alter Self. But the wording was vague enough that the player thought the two Kai point move was a polymorph within the PC's type, humanoid outsider, etc. I accidentally let my players interpret Beacon of Hope as a heal to max HP every time the creatures received any healing. But it worked out, because I was and am a fledgling DM who had no idea how to balance encounters. They were in a very, very deadly fight and I managed to remember they needed concentration checks before I got cheesed by a one point of lay on hands heal to max. The fight ended up lasting three hours. I remember a thread on this sub a year or so ago where a guy was complaining about his DM running toughness as doubling your hit dice and concentration bonus for every level or some nonsense. And he was mad because the wizard in the party had like 250 HP at level 10, whereas his frontline character had less than half that much. In my own experience, I remember one of my friends in the early 3E days misinterpreting the level advancement charts. Rather than seeing the BAB and saves as saying what your bonus was at each level, i.e. BAB plus one at first, plus two at second, etc., he thought you added that much each level. So, instead of his fighter having a plus three BAB, a plus three fort, a plus one will, plus one reflex, all at level three, he thought he had a plus six BAB, plus seven fort, plus one will, plus one reflex. Luckily, we caught it early and he got a, like a, a 30 to hit and the DM was shocked. After he read up the math to us, we figured out the problem and set him straight. Attacked by a dragon who our melee fighters surrounded and started wailing on. Dragon flies up in the air and they all get excited to use opportunity attacks to try and kill it before it flies away. Opportunity attacks don't work when creatures leave your threat range vertically. We were very confused. That sounded like a glitch in a video game to me, not a logical ruling for D&D. When I first started DMing 5e for a few friends, we thought that you added int mod to every magic missile, so my monsters were getting nuked <laughs> by my first level wizard who was using a ninth level invocationist feature, and we thought wizards were completely broken. My level 5 cleric thought he could use 11 spells in one day and was trying to cast them in his bonus action as well as using his spell save to add to hit. Then he texted a buddy of mine saying I was coming after him for questioning this. I have two off the top of my head. Friend was DMing a second edition game and the enemy caster cast friends, which as written is only supposed to be a charisma buff but he treated it as a mass charm spell. I was the only one who made the save and spent the rest of the session trying to free my mind controlled party members. Was playing third edition and another player interpreted the spring attack feat as allowing a full attack and a move action in the same round as opposed to being able to split a move action before and after an attack action. DM didn't question it, so neither did I. 
had a level 1 warlock try and have a staff of magi as a starting weapon the other day. The eye roll and the look on our DM's face was priceless. My level 1 PC thought color spray did damage. After he nearly shot an ogre, I made sure I memorized all of my player's spells from there on out. Just explained to my wife this week, who is new to Cleric, that you can memorize domain spells for free, not cast them for free. Apparently having unlimited scorching rays and fireballs was not a red flag for her. When I started playing 5e for the first time, I completely screwed up bard spell slots. I thought that as long as I had an open spell slot, I could cast any spell listed in the bard spell section of the book. That's not how it works. I don't know if it fits, but it sure was funny. A highly chaotic player was using Tharmaturgy to harass a player in a carriage, only for her to step out of the carriage with a magic casting gun and use Detect Thoughts to find out who in the party was harassing her. The player, realizing he was about to be caught, pulled out a deck of cards and rolled Deception against himself to convince himself he had been playing Solitaire the whole time. <laughs> He succeeded. It was only allowed because this wasn't of any real consequence. It was just the party screwing around with cantrips. I have a player, 3.5, that thought his interpretation of the DM tool for making monster races and savage species was a hard ruling mechanic and tried to make an ECL7 character for a starting level 4 campaign. He argued that this obscure dragon race should get all four levels of sorcerer spellcasting at the start of the racial class, along with its other abilities. And then he'd just take three dead levels of racial hit dice. Here's how this went. I said we'd be starting at level four and that nothing more than level adjustment plus three was allowed. He thought that somehow this meant that you could play a four hit die character with a plus three level adjustment template on top, making an ECL7 character. Now every other party member used common sense and realized that starting level four meant ECL4. This asshole decided that I wasn't specific enough. What a toolbox. I tried throwing a bag of holding through a portal to another plane, expecting the portal to close or explode. Turns out, I misinterpreted the rule, so it did neither, and all I ended up doing was tossing my bag of holding into the plane of death. Before I had ever really looked into Sorcerer class, I had a pretty competent player build one for my campaign. He played wild magic and rolled on the wild magic table after every spell. After recovering all of his spell slots three times and aging wildly a few times, I thought to look into it. Had a fur bulg in the group. They count as a size larger when pushing, pulling, or carrying, and this made him believe, one, if he pushed with his fingers on either side of enemy's head or neck, that the intense pressure would cause it to explode. Two, since his carry weight was so high, he decided he could run around carrying a two dead giant wolves and get 100% cover since he was physically covered up. Even though he was still attacking and the book says that if you are double covered, you get only the highest level of cover granted from one object. Not a combination. 